Hello, everybody. My name is Juan Carlos Fernandez. I'm from the science faculty in the National Autonomous University in Mexico. And we are going to talk about a reduction method for semilinear PDEs. This is a joint work with Oscar Palmas, Jimmy Petian, Monica Clapp, and Alberto Saldaña, all of them from Mexico. And what are we going to talk about? We're going to discuss a method using the geometry of some Riemannian manifold and semi-Riemannian manifold in order to obtain, instead of a PDE, an ODE, which are simpler to solve. So we are going to, to begin with the, this talk is going to be divided in three, in three parts. The first part will be about the Riemannian case. The second part will be the applications to PDE. And the last part is going to, is going to be about the semi-Riemannian case. So in this first part, we're going to begin with the Riemannian case. The motivation here is the following. Imagine that you have this kind of semi-linear equation. This is the Laplacian, and this is a continuous or smooth function in RM. One of the first things that we learn in PDE courses is how to obtain in RM, in the whole RM, the, let's say, kind of fundamental solutions. And this, and to obtain this, the trick is to consider um, functions which are radial, okay? So we consider, we look for radial solutions having this form. U of X is a function on the real line composed with this, norm okay so u is going to be a solution to this equation if and only if u is a solution to this guy here what is important to remark is that we have a geometric configuration here and all the solutions to this problem which are radial are going to be constant on these spheres and we have here a singular sphere, which is reflected in this singularity at zero. So this is a singular ODE. Let's make a closer look to that, to this. If we consider F to be the function that takes the norm of a vector, then the Laplacian is going to be the Laplacian of this composition. And if we make the computations, we are going to obtain a second derivative of B composed with F, a first derivative of B composed with F, a square of the gradient of F, and a Laplacian of F. If these two guys can be written as a function of F itself, we can reduce the Laplacian into a one-dimensional Laplacian, a Laplacian depending only on this function defined on the real line. What happens with this, with this function? This function satisfies that the square of the, the square of, the, of its gradient is equals one everywhere. So it is a function of F, of F itself. And the Laplacian, the Laplacian is given by this, which is again a function of F itself. So, as I told you before, as I told you before, the Laplacian is going to be given by this operator here. And this is a radial Laplacian. This is a Laplacian acting on functions defined only in, in this half line. Okay, so we reduce the problem of solving an M-dimensional PDE into an 
one dimensional PDE because we are we are obtaining a new uh, a new kind of um, Laplacian on one dimension. We can also make other examples. For instance, if, if we decompose our M into two parts and we consider the norm of the first component, then we're going to, to obtain a really similar Laplacian like this one, but instead of M here, we obtain K. Another example is given when we take the last, uh, the projection onto the last factor of our M. So this Laplacian is going to be the one dimensional Laplacian. Here we have a singularity. Here we do not have a singularity. If we make a geometric point of view, what we have here is that this function is constant on these cylinders. And here, is, here it is a singular cylinder, which is given by the singularity here. And in, this, in the case of this function, we are going to obtain parallel hyper, hyper planes. And there are no singularities here. So we are not going to have singularities here. OK? So we are going to, to generalize this idea to Riemannian manifolds. What we are actually studying is the following. We fix a Riemannian manifold and a function defined on the whole Riemannian manifold, a globally defined function. It is isoparametric if there are two functions in such a way that the Laplacian and the square of the gradient and of the norm of the gradient are given by functions of f itself. In this case, we can reduce this semilinear equation, partial differential equation on m by taking u as b composed with f. This b has its domain in the image of f which is a subset of R, of the real line. So we have that U is going to be a solution to this PDE, if and only if we have a solution to this ODE. And also we have here what we are going to call isoparametric Laplacian, which are a generalized, a generalization of the radial Laplacian. One important feature of this kind of solutions is that the level sets of U, as we have this composition with F, are going to be the level sets of F. So it is important to understand the level set of F, the geometry behind the level sets of an isoparametric function. So we start studying the geometry of these guys. We consider the, a level set of the isoparametric function. We have two cases. T is a regular value, and in this case, ST is going to be a hypersurface in M, and it is going to be called isoparametric hypersurface. And if T is a critical value, one can show that this guy is going to be always a submanifold, and it is called the focal submanifold. Cartan showed the following. He recovers all the geometry of the isoparametric hypersurfaces in, in the spaces of constant sectional curvature, that is, on Rm, on the hyperbolic space and the sphere. So he actually proved that S is isoparametric, so it is a level set of an, a globally defined isoparametric function, which is given by so, well, like solving some differential equations. Here we have that we have to look for functions satisfying this equation. So it is an isoparametric function has uh, an analytic flavor in its definition. What actually 
Heart and Recovers was the geometric ideas behind this. So he proved that F is isoparametric in this analytic sense, if and only if all the principal curvatures are constant. Recall that we are just in this kind of spaces. In a general space, in a general manifold, this is no longer true. But if, the sec if we have constant sectional curvature, this is true. And what, uh, what does he prove? He proved that on Rn, the only hypersurfaces that has constant principal curvatures are these three guys. The configuration given by spheres, the foliation actually is a foliation given by spheres, the foliation given by cylinders, and the foliation given by, uh, by hyperplane. And there are no more. So we cannot expect to reduce an equation to obtain different Laplacians, different isoparametric Laplacians in RM because we only have these three guys as isoparametric hypersurfaces. So RM is really boring in this kind of, or in the existence of this kind of isoparametric hypersurfaces. And that's the reason we cannot obtain more interesting Laplacians or more interesting reductions of, of PDEs into ODEs. That's why we always look for radial solutions because they are the most interesting, let's say. But what happens in the other cases? In case of the hyperbolic space, Cartan was able also to classify all the isoparametric hypersurfaces. And they look more or less like the same on RM. They are spheres or spheres, kind of cylinders on hyperplane. So they, there is a more, the, the geometry in the hyperbolic space is richer than in RM. But what is really, really striking is that this guy, this compact guy, has really interesting isoparametric functions and really interesting isoparametric hypersurf hypersurfaces. So on SM, on the sphere, we're going to denote by L to the number of distinct principal curvatures. A deep result obtained by Nusner no? is that this number is going to be always one, two, three, four, and six. Even if this dimension is one million, the number of principal curvatures, the of this, or different principal curvatures is going to be one of these guys, always. So Cartan tried to classify also the isoparametric hypersurfaces in the sphere. He was able to classify the case L equals one, two, and three. And he showed that they are orbits of isometric groups. This kind of hypersurfaces are called homogeneous. But later, Oseki and Takeuchi and Ferus Kerger and Musner, they showed the existence of non-homogeneous examples in the case L equals four. Actually, they describe a really beautiful theory about how to construct, to construct a lot of examples of different, of different isoparametric hypersurfaces and functions having different configurations. And what happened this year? This year, the classification in the case L equals four is now complete. Cartan put this problem of classification more or less in 1938 or 1939. 
And the problem of classifying all isoparametric hypersurfaces on the sphere was a really, really interesting, challenging, and it was one of Yao's problem. I don't remember the number. I think it was the 49 problem of Yao. And it is really, it has been um, a really interesting problem to study that has so many ideas. But it is, not, it is not clear if the classification is over or not. Why? Because the remaining case, L equals six, Miyaoka said that all the hypersurfaces with six principal curvatures are homogeneous. And she, tries to class, she tried to classify them. But there was a mistake, a little gap in her proof. And then she published an errata and again, I, uh, the, someone finds another gap in her proof. And I don't know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure that this gap has been solved yet. Now we are going to give concrete examples of isoparametric functions and hypersurfaces. The first example is with one principal curvature, if we consider the sphere and the point of this on the sphere, we consider this polynomial. So what we're actually doing is considering P and its antipodal and considering this, um, let's say this axially symmetric manifold here, the parallel. the parallels of the sphere are going to be the isoparametric hypersurface. And P and minus P are going to be focus of money. Another, another example is that if we decompose our M plus one into two parts, and we consider this polynomial here, this quadratic polynomial, then the high, this function is going to be isoparametric and its hypersurfaces are products of the spheres. And the focus of manifolds is that if are, are given by this, first, this sphere and this sphere. We have, again, two kinds of focus of manifolds. In the case L equals four, that the theory given by Ferus, Kersen, and Musner, they consider some dimensions. Not they, these examples do not exist in other dimensions. These examples, L equals one and L equals two, these examples uh, exist in all dimensions bigger than three. But in this case, we need a specific kind of dimension. And we are going to consider some symmetric operators on Rm, such that they satisfy these properties. These properties may look a little bit strange, but if you have uh, made, if you make computations with quaternions and more general and other kind of of numerical systems, you, uh, what you're going to see is that the quaternions satisfy this kind of properties. Actually, these operators are representations of the Clifford algebra. And these guys are called Clifford systems. For the Clifford system, if we choose a Clifford system in Rm, Rm plus one, excuse me, and you consider this kind of polynomial, this is now a fourth order polynomial. What, we're, what you're going to obtain is that this guy is isoparametric. If we put here the, the Clifford systems and the geometry is a little bit complicated because all the manifolds uh, all the isoparametric hypersurfaces are going to be tubes 
around Clifford Stephens of Manifest. So these are going to have a more interesting geometry, more, uh, more complicated geometry. And what we are, what I want to, to recover here is that in every of these examples, the number of focus of manifold equals two. We are going to be to see why we only have two focus of manifolds. And the focus of manifold generate all the foliation given by these isoparametric functions. Well, we have now a lot of examples of isoparametric functions, and we are going to use them to reduce PDEs. So what do we obtain if we consider an isoparametric function? How, do, how, how does the Laplacian, the isoparametric Laplacian will look like? Well, there is a, a deep result also in the theory that says that if you consider an isoparametric function, an isoparametric hypersurface, there will be an isoparametric function, which is a polynomial, having its image in minus one, one, all the isoparametric foliation, all the, the hypersurfaces given by, well, all the, uh, the isoparametric hypersurfaces are given by the inverse image of T in this open set, the focus of manifolds are exactly minus one and plus one. That's why we always have exactly two focus of manifolds. But moreover, we can compute explicitly the square of the of the norm of the gradient by this linear function the um by this quadratic function and the laplacian is given by this linear function of f where m1 and m2 are the multiplicities of the principal curvatures there are one can show that there are exactly two different multiplicities so as we have here this interval, one can, one can consider another composition with another function, and we are going to obtain a more geometric view. So we can consider this function. And if we compute the Laplacian, what we are going to obtain is that the term of the second derivative has a constant and then the part of the first derivative is going to be given by a function which is given explicitly in, in terms of cosines and, and sines, but as the function sine of t is, um, is singular, is zero at zero and pi, this function is singular. So this is a singular Laplacian. And it is singular in two points. Okay. So this guy here is our isoparametric Laplacian. In the next video, we are going to apply this theory to some to some problems called Yamabe time problems. And we are going to obtain some results about the existence of novel solutions.